first uh, apologize uh, apologies for the title, which is a bit a bit awkward. I find finally, um, I took oracle and prediction in a very naive way, and um, oracle. I, I would say I, I, I won't make justice to this both regime of the, uh, the prediction talking about the future, assuming they can say something true about the future. So I, I take it in a very naive way. Prediction is more or less an non authoritative way. Um, authoritative uh, techno-scientific construction, that's how I understood it here. And Oracle is uh, uh, somehow a fascinating magic artifact who also enables one to tell something about the future. And what is interesting to me in this uh, uh, conjunctions of these two words is that algorithms somehow seems to uh, be predicated of both terms. So uh, a predictive algorithmic model can be said, depending uh, on the people, uh, can be seen as an oracle, as a prediction, as both. And um, not in incidentally, I think, the two words that come back the m more often when we talk about algorithms spontaneously are recipe, which was said earlier, and black boxes, also said earlier. And the, the point of my intervention here would be to try to densify a bit the concept of algorithm by asking a very simple question, which would be, how do computer scientists relate to their objects, to their algorithms? So let's, uh, I, pro I suggest we take a uh, provisory definition of algorithm, we take recipe. So actually the analogy holds for three main characteristics. Algorithm and recipe have both, both, uh, what's, is that good? Uh, I can, yeah. Uh, Okay, I, I just keep it like that. Um, so, <coughs> recipe and algorithm share that both are a sequence of instruction oriented toward the tasks that the three characteristics they share. The two differences are um, that algorithms are rather formal and uh, they suppose uh, uh, rather unskilled operators to execute them. Uh, if you have a good recipe with a bad chef, you probably have a bad dish. So that's actually a big difference between the two. Uh, I would uh, bring in uh, some more precision again. And uh, I'll pick up things which have been said by Tyler and Nathan. Um, so when you, you look at how computer scientists, what do they call algorithm? How do they uh, communicate algorithm between themselves? Usually you have this kind of thing, that's pseudocode, so that's an abstract representation of an algorithm, and that's what they call an algorithm. If you look and read scientific articles in computer science, that's what you will find, and most probably you will also find uh, these kind of things, uh, like uh, uh, graphical representations of, of a structure and neural networks, and with a sequ sequence of instruction you can follow, that's more or less a flowchart. So flowcharts and pseudocodes are the two ways to communicate algorithms between computer scientists, at least the two major ways of doing so. Um, so algorithm is, is an abstract thing, uh, which has to be abstracted. It has to be implemented as well in computer code, and it has to be run. So you have kind of three possible level of existence of the algorithm. Variations, I was happy to hear the talk, is a big problem in computer science, science community as well. They have really big difficulties in saying, is this algorithm that just came out the same as mine I published two years ago? How can we assess the identity, the similarity of both things? So I, I was happy to hear that in legal terms and from a legal perspective, they had the same kind of problems. So, no, I'll speed up. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ground a bit more um, our case study. I've been working or uh, following for three years now on a European project called P5. So I think that's Privacy Perimeter Preserving Protection Project. That's the acronym. And uh, basically the idea is rather simple. You have a, a perimeter of security. You want to survey it, to monitor it, to automatically detect intrusions and to identify 
if classify intrusions uh, in two classes, threatening intrusion or non-threatening intrusion. So that's the aim of the project. At the center of the project, uh, so that's quite big, I would say. I think the budget, the total overall budget is more than three, four million euros. It involves uh, a dozen of European partners. You have uh, uh, Swedish Research Defense Department, the Home Office of UK, um, SAGEM France, which is w one of the biggest weapon sellers in France and Europe. So it, it's quite a big project, interesting to follow. And um, at the core of the project, you have computer vision. That's the main field. Computer vision is a f uh, subfield of machine learning which seek to automate the analysis of images. So in computer vision, you have computer. So <coughs> this means you have bodies, if you want. You have sensors here. So in the project, they have thermal sensors, camera, radars, and acoustic detectors as well. So that's one piece of the body. You have cables, another piece, and servers. Which, on which algorithm are run. So when we say computer vision, that's the computer part of computer vision. Then the, the question is vision. What is vision? For an algorithm, that's vision for us maybe without the grid, and that's vision for an algorithm. So the question is <coughs> how, do, how can an algorithm classify matrices of number and say this matrix, matrix of number is threatening, another one, uh, this other one is not threatening. So basically, you have many phases. First, you have to detect if something is new in the landscape. Then you have to be able to track, to track the new object detected. Then you have to be able to classify it and to warn if it's threatening. So that's here you have many variations. The algorithm shouldn't warn anything about. And that's a lot of different matrices if you look you have leaves, you have moon, you have sun, you have variations of light. Th this is non-significant variations for a security system. So here you have an example, a very simple example of tracking. You have a green, <coughs> a green box which is moving to the right and in the same time the red one moving up to the right. Um, and they cross at some point and here what is the algorithm supposed to do? He's supposed to understand that at some point the two elements crossed and merged and then still are the same after uh, they unmerged. Is it more or less clear? Do you have an intuition? Yeah. So here is another problem. As you have seen here, you have many cameras, many sensors. The problem is how this one can understand it's seeing the same as this one or this one. So algorithm have to coordinate all these uh, perceptive apparatus. And that's what they see, or at least that's what we see from our viewpoints if we switch it. And then you have to imagine you have matrices of number behind it. And I, I keep it simple. I, I, I didn't bring in time. Obviously, uh, each image is taking, uh, each sensor is taking more than 20 images per second. So this means a very simple example um, to make you understand that when we talk about computer vision and algorithm, bodies are rather important. So here you want to install your, your system. You have a, a problem, which is calibration. You have to make sure that they all take pictures and they all take pictures at the same time. If you have a, a slight lag uh, in the inner clock of uh, the different sensors, this means this uh, one will think uh, it has taken picture at uh, uh, two two uh, two a.m. for instance, and the other at two a.m. plus one second. But then they won't be able to understand they have seen the same object. So here you have a big uh, uh, apparatus which allows to uh, operate uh, synchronization between the different sensors. And if you want to, uh, the, the solution engineers choose. Here is they decide to uh, synchronize it with the server centrally, then send a message every second in order to reinitialize all the inner clocks of the sensors. And they have to take into account the length of the cable because if a cable is long, then the uh, uh, message to say you have to uh, reinitialize uh, the clock will take long, a longer time and then you have, will have a lag. So it's actually uh, really important to do this bodily setup 
correctly if you want to process an algorithm. This brings up into the last part of the presentation. How, many, how much time? Yeah, five minutes. Five minutes. Uh, so the problem is we want to classify between threatening and non-threatening behaviors. All these technical systems uh, as filmed and uh, partly pre-processed. Classification is a traditional statistical problem. So here you have two possible features. Observation could, it can be speed and shape of uh, uh, the object which has been detected and tracked. And then according to these two parameters, speed and shape, you have to say, okay, I have to correlate the parameter to draw a line and to make sure that on one side of the light, all the red bullets are threatening behavior and on the, uh, on the opposite left side, uh, on the left of the, of the line, uh, threatening behavior on the right of the light, non-threatening behavior. That, that's the classical problem. So here is how everybody proceeds in statistics or machine learning. You have a first approximation here and you can see that you, you don't classify correctly. Then you have to <coughs> uh, make another guess. It's a bit better, but not sufficient enough for a highly uh, sophisticated uh, surveying system which has to work on critical infrastructures like nuclear, nuclear power plant and so on. So you do a better approximation here. That's what we call training or inference of parameters in statistics. The idea is rather simple and it's the same for all the three. You have first to be able to make prediction. That's how the model works, a classification model. First, you have to be able to make prediction. Second, you need to be able to assess the errors you're making uh, when you make a prediction. Third, you have to have a rule in order to correct your initial prediction. Okay, so here you can do it since we have two dimensions and uh, simple values and few classes, you can do it with traditional mathematical tools. The problem is when you have highly dimensional objects. So if we take, if we go back to this one, Let's say we have, uh, I don't know, 100 on 10 pixel here. This makes 1,000 pixels. If we want 1,000 pixel to correlate it uh, uh, directly, rawly, this means we, we would need 100 dimensions, okay? So we have a problem. Traditional mathematical tools can't deal with this kind of dimensions and not at this speed since, as I said, you have many sensors at the same time who needs to be processed in real time um, and with 20 images per second from each sensor. So you use machine learning techniques. Neural network is one example. And <coughs> it do it uh, quite correctly. So here you have to imagine you have the inputs, all the dimension, every pixel, I, I, here we have a, a very simple image with only three pixels, obviously. Then you process it in hidden layers, what they call, and then you have a, res, a result which gives you uh, a score uh, uh, which will help you to decide if it's a threat or if it's not a threat. So that's more or less how it works. Um, so I'll conclude now. The question I, I raised first is how do computer scientists relate to their algorithms? So, it's a very, very short answer, but I would say in the field work I've done, uh, not in machine learning, but in meta heuristics and optimization in Brussels, in the field work I've done, which is a smaller field work here on this European project, uh, in, in, in both fields, I think I have at least three kinds of relation. Uh, one could be, say, theoretical, the th second, experimental, the third, Metaf metaphorical, and so experimental is probably the first to go on. So how do you assess the performance of an algorithm? You have uh, uh, a, a big data set, standardized data sets, and then you run algorithm, your models, al your algorithms which will build predictive models on these data sets, and you compare the scores of the algorithm, you compare the accuracy, and then you can define which one is better. So. That's one part of it. Then the second part, always in this experimental uh, relation uh, computer scientists develop, is they have to be able to relate uh, the increase in performance 
to uh, a piece of the technical scheme. So let's say here we have a, a, one kind of function, linear function. Uh, we can rep replace it the, with another nonlinear function or, or a sigmoid function. They have many, many different functions which, which can uh, uh, occupy the, this decision unit. They have to be able to identify that the increase in performance is related to the change in this decision unit. And then not only that, to be able to give an interpretation and to develop a, a, a form of understanding in order to account for this performance. So here I, I go a bit against the claim that uh, uh, you don't have a concern for knowledge in computer science and uh, engineering application. The, I think the locus of the knowledge is just displaced. We don't care about how do we see, but we care about what in the algorithm will enable you, us to detect and see better. And that's the kind of experimental understanding which goes on in machine learning. The theoretical understanding, which is less common particularly in machine learning, um, uh, has also uh, two faces. That's really conclusion. Okay. Um, uh, one would be, okay, I want to know, um, in theory, how well this algorithm is running, how many loops, how many iterations I need, how complex it is. Complexity in computer science is uh, the, the uh, standard way of measuring algorithm efficiency. And so the question uh, of a computer scientist would be, how complex is my algorithm? And then he has uh, tools, formal tools from theoretical computer science to derive uh, properties uh, uh, by analyzing the algorithm. The, problems, the problem is that these formal tools are very limited. And so he has to make simple models. He, he cannot tackle uh, big neural networks with 100 hidden layers and many different units and, and derive properties formally. Uh, to uh, describe the behavior of his algorithm. He has to make very simple models, like um, uh, an, an example of a, result, uh, a theoretical result for computer, uh, for a neural network is, imagine we have a, three, uh, a neural network with only three nodes, then I can formally prove that um, uh, training the neural network on any data set is uh, uh, highly complex, let's say. They have more precise. Uh, so that's one theoretical relation you can develop to neural network. A second one is uh, uh, simply to use math in order to show that the procedure as you develop has some uh, ma mathematical foundation. The last one, and I, I'll, con I'll definitely conclude on that, and I, I thank Tyler to have bring all this genealogy where the met metaphor is overpresent. It's very interesting to see how metaphor drives computer scientists to manipulate the technical scheme. And often they want to dismiss the metaphorical side of their own practice. Not all machine learning uh, learner pra uh, learning practitioner, but uh, parts of it uh, see the metaphor as a residue that should be uh, uh, examined and replaced by a proper formal uh, apparatus. And I think what, what, what is really striking when uh, I've read many introductory books in machine learning or follow many courses or read syllabuses is they don't need the neural metaphor at all. They, they, you could call that automata uh, and, and describe it this way, but they keep using it. And also in other fields of computer science, you have this kind of metaphor uh, thing going on, and the hypothesis I would like to suggest, and I can't show it here, uh, is that metaphors in algorithmic practices are a way, are strategies to cope with the complexity and to enable a, a sort of relation of the computer scientist to his algorithm that will allow him to invent and manipulate interestingly, the technical scheme of his algorithm in order to invent new algorithm. That would be it.